Hi there, JP Dice. Welcome into my channel, Beyond the Briefing. We talk about weather and flying on this YouTube channel. I am really excited to be doing this. I've had all this build-up weather information from 25 years of doing TV weather, and I wanted to find kind of a marriage between aviation and weather. You know, they're, they're, they're closely related, and so many times folks are asking me, okay, how do you do this? What does this mean? So this is kind of my outlet to, uh, to talk to you guys. First off, uh, in the last episode, we talked about skew T diagrams, that vertical profile of the atmosphere. All right, so where's that data come from? Well, the data comes from models, or it can come from weather balloons if you're looking at it in essentially real time. Uh, you're looking at it from the uh, daily release of weather balloons. If you're looking at it into the future, you're looking at those virtual soundings coming from the forecast models. Let's get right to forecast models, and, and what are we talking about here? I know a lot of us use uh, forecast models on a daily basis and may not even realize it. Let's get right to for flight, our electronic flight bag many of us use. Other folks may use Garmin Pilot. A lot of information out there. A lot of these EFBs are fantastic, all of them. So uh, right now I am looking at the METAR for the Birmingham Shuttlesworth International Airport. Now remember, METAR is right now. TAF is in the future. And over the last year or so, they added one more option, and that is called MOSS. And I had some folks that were kind of getting a little confused about MOSS and using that almost like a TAF. It goes out a lot further in time, but it is automated. Okay, a TAF is actually created by folks at the National Weather Service Office, your local National Weather Service Office. MOSS data, MOSS stands for Model Output Statistics. And this is just raw data that comes off a forecast model. Uh, I use it as a loose guidance, but I certainly would not rely on that to make my go or no-go plans. It just kind of gives me some loose guidance. Uh, we've used MOSS in the uh, TV weather world for a long time. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. You take it with a grain of salt. But TAFs still are going to take precedence over MOSS data. Just remember that. So we're going to talk a little bit about these, uh, these different forecast models. And I want to give you an idea of what we're looking at. There's a lot of them out there. And I realize it can be very confusing. Which model do you use? Where do I get this model information? All the forecasts that are generated by folks at a TV station or the National Weather Service or anywhere else, even the meteorologist at Delta Airlines, some of the uh, air carriers, FedEx, UPS, they use these forecast models. You can use them too. Most of them are available out there and they're absolutely free. Uh, the short-term weather models are higher re resolution. They give you a better picture of what's going on. So we have the HRRR, that's the high resolution rapid refresh. It goes out 36 hours. You have the RAP, the rapid refresh high resolution model. That one goes out 21 hours. Three kilometer NAM, that's the high resolution North American model, goes out 60 hours. And you also have the NAM, the lower res version that goes out 84 hours. So these are the computer forecast models that you may use if you're planning a trip, say, uh, the next couple of days. These are going to give you a better picture of what's going on because they can actually discern the individual cells that may develop, kind of like a future radar. It really gives you a pretty good idea on temperatures, wind speeds, also the potential for fog. I use them all the time as it's the basis for what we do in meteorology. Okay, if you're planning a longer trip, something that's going to be a week away or maybe seven days away, you'll use the long-range weather models. The two primary, GFS, Global Forecast System, 384 hours it goes out. Now, I will tell you, 384th hour, that's a grain of salt, that's a guess. You know, really past about five or six days, these things start getting really iffy. The European model goes out 240 hours. That's the one model you, you are limited on as far as having access to data. Uh, many of the sites out there still charge you for the European data. You can get some of the data, but not all of it. Uh, European model has been regarded by many in the meteorology com community as being the superior long-range model, but to be honest with you, I have seen significant errors both on the GFS and the European model. So you just have to uh, kind of see which one's performing the best and compare it with what's happening in reality. 
versus what is actually happening with the model. So sometimes you actually look at the radar data right now and you look at the first hour of the model and see if they kind of mesh up. If they're meshing up well, the model's probably performing fairly well. So let me talk to you a little bit about high resolution versus low resolution models. One of the main models we use when we're talking about the short term, and this model comes out really every hour, you have a version of the HRRR. It's three kilometers. That means it is a very high resolution model. When you got models that get even uh, higher resolution than that, and those are some of the experimentals out there, they, they produce a lot of noise, so they don't really work that well. The three kilometer tends to work pretty well. And this model, if you look at the picture on the right hand side, you can actually see some really some simulated radar almost. It looks like you're looking at a radar image. And to be honest, some of the imagery, it's almost difficult to discern the forecast model data from an actual radar image. It's that good. If you look at the higher resolution model data on the right versus the lower resolution model data on the left, can you see how I call it blobo vision? It's really kind of all meshed together. And you can really tell a big difference by using the high res data. You get a, a better handle on storm structure. Now these models run several times per day. You have the 12Z run, you have the 18Z, that's our midday run, 0Z run, and the 6Z run. The 18Z and the 6Z are called intermediate runs. Sometimes those are not quite as accurate as your primary runs, like your 12Z and your 0Z, but essentially most of these models will run four times per day. As I mentioned before, the HRRR is going to be the model that actually will run every hour. The RAP will do that as well. So let's get to the model side. If you remember before, uh, this is PivotalWeather.com. It's one of the fabulous model sites out there. There are many that you can choose from. This is kind of my go-to, and most of it is free. There are some components where you can pay to get a little bit more information, but there's a lot of things you can get here on Pivotal Weather. So we're going to begin, and I've got it zeroed in on the southeast. I'm based in the Birmingham area, so this is kind of the view that I typically work off of. And I've got it in, if you look right here, HRRR right there. I've got it on the HRRR. That's the High Resolution Rapid Refresh Model. We'll go to the 23Z run, and this is going to go out to 18 hours. Okay, you have 18 hours worth of model data there. All right, so let's just kind of take it through. We'll go to that 18th hour. And this is uh, just before noon tomorrow. And can you see it shows some individual little showers starting to pop up. See those little green dots? And then you've got some activity here in southern Louisiana. So this is really a future radar. This is the HRRR. And I want to show you this. Okay, this is the high resolution data. Let's compare what that looks like with the GFS, which is going to be lower resolution data. Can you see the difference? Look over Louisiana. It's kind of blobby, okay? That's low resolution. This is the GFS that we typically use as we go out uh, on a longer range forecast. When you get into a closer time frame, you use this kind of data. And you can see those little bitty cells there that are, are developing. And we'll just kind of take this on out. And this is uh, tomorrow afternoon, okay? So you can see the individual little showers and thunderstorms that are developing. So you can look at rain. You could also look at the winds. Let's say we're uh, making a trip and we're going to be flying at, say, 9,000 feet. We shall look at the winds right there. And there we have the wind barbs. That's pretty cool. So we're looking at the wind barbs and the winds at... 9,000 feet, according to this, are out of the south, and they're fairly light at about 5 to 10 knots. And this time of the year, the summertime, the winds are typically much lower. When you start picking up those nice tailwinds, that typically happens during the winter, spring, and fall. Summer, the winds are pretty light. We can look at wind parameters. We can also look at severe weather parameters. This is a very handy tool. There's a lot of severe weather parameters. One of the key severe weather uh, parameters that we like to use is something called CAPE, Convectively Available Potential Energy. And this is the surface-based CAPE, and it is off the charts for it tomorrow. 
doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have a lot of severe weather. It means there's a lot of energy in the atmosphere. During the, the summer months, you have this. The temperatures are pretty warm, so you have a lot of unstable air, a lot of rising air. So these numbers will typically be fairly high during the summer months as we go over here to what we call our EHI, and that's our Energy Helicity Index. This is looking at the spin in the atmosphere plus the instability pretty low for it tomorrow. So that means not a big chance of severe weather. But there's a lot of parameters on there, and I, I realize you can really get complicated with this stuff, uh, more so than you may ever want to use flying an airplane. Uh, if you want to get that complicated, you can, and in some of our future videos, we're going to get in a little bit deeper with some of this. But basically, for most of us, we're going to be looking at, hey, when are the thunderstorms going to kick in, and how long are they going to last? Let's look at later in the week. So. I'm on the HRRR, and I want to go out a little bit further in time, and we'll go out, say, 57 hours from now. And this is going to be, I'm recording this on a Sunday, and that's on a Wednesday. That's a Wednesday morning, and here's a Wednesday afternoon. Still not a whole lot going on, so not an overly wet forecast that we're looking at here this week. But you can see the parameters uh, over on the uh, left-hand side, and here at the top you have all the different forecast models. You have many of the ones that I talked to you about uh, just a little bit ago, but you also have some others. There's the Canadian model. You have the UK Met, which is another European model. Uh, you have some experimental type models on there from the uh, National Severe Storms Laboratory if you want to really get into uh, some of the severe weather stuff. Let's see if we can find the jet stream. You want to play find that jet stream. We'll click off the skew T and let's go to the GFS. We'll get a global picture here and we will go national. Maps are going to change a little bit and the jet stream is going to be around the 200 millibar level. So we're going to go up to about 200 millibars. Well, by golly, there's the jet stream. Can you see it? Right there. There it is, it's highlighted, and you can see the winds in that jet core that's going to be just to the north of New York State. That jet core, the winds are about 87 knots. So the jet stream, what we're showing here on this model, we have this big ridge of high pressure right here in the middle of the country. That's why we're not seeing a lot of rain. A little dippity do around the uh, upper peninsula of Michigan where we could see a little bit of stormy weather coming in yeah, later in the week. But uh, that's what we have. That's kind of gives us the, the big view on the atmosphere. And I know many of you will take these trips and you'll go you know, quite a distance. Some of us stay a little bit closer, but you may be in a, a, a jet and doing a corporate trip or something like that, or the airlines, and you're going to go on a longer distance, you're going to deal with a lot of different kinds of, of varying air masses and different kinds of winds. Very handy information. I'm going to give you a little information here. This data, and some of the software even I use, there's a, a program called BuffKit that was developed at... Uh, the National Weather Service office in Buffalo. And we'll have an episode where we uh, download that and show you how that works. That's got some aviation parameters in it. It's a free program too. It's free and you can do some cool stuff. A few years ago when I went over to Delta Airlines and visited their uh, weather operations. They have a whole weather operations uh, set up over there. A lot of meteorologists working. So in addition to National Weather Service information, they're doing their own thing and getting that to uh, the, uh, the pilots and crews out there. Uh, they're using that software buff kit. I went in, I'm like, hey, I know that software. So pretty cool stuff. There's a lot of information out here that all of us can easily have access to and use it in our flight planning instead of just simply relying on that weather brief. And that's really the core of what we're doing here. I want you to go beyond that briefing and get a good picture of what the atmosphere is doing. You read those weather briefs, and there's a lot of information in there, but some of it really doesn't pertain to your individual trip. What we're doing here uh, in this program is allowing you to find that data figure out what time it's going to rain, when you're going to have the worst weather, when you're going to have the potential for severe weather, where the highest winds are going to be, where you can pick up the tailwind, where you can uh, you know, uh, plan that trip a bit more efficiently using all this data that we have. So a lot of different kinds of models out there. It's a little bit, folks, like alphabet soup. But once you play around with it, and I encourage you to do that, play around with some of these models and, and take them out into different time periods and you'll get a better understanding how all of this works. Uh, forecast models or numerical weather prediction, that's really the core of, of what goes into the TAFs that you read and also some of the forecast, of course, that you see on TV or on the National Weather Service website or flight service, wherever you're getting that weather briefing information. 
Uh, as always, if you like this, click like, and also don't forget to subscribe to Beyond the Briefing. This is just a blast for me as a meteorologist and a pilot, a flight instructor, to be able to talk to you guys and share my weather information and my weather knowledge to help make you better and safer uh, pilots out there. Until next time, we'll see you here on Beyond the Briefing.